Thank you very much, everyone. Um, it's such a pleasure to be here, not just because Nigel invited me because uh, he's such a great friend, but also because it makes me now, um, I can now call myself cool, uh, having spoken at uh, the International Crisis uh, Mappers Conference. Um, I'm actually a real doctor. Uh, I'm an obstetrician and gynecologist. <laughs> Uh, and people always wonder, you know, why is it an obstetrician and gynecologist ends up in a humanitarian sector, having had uh, the pleasure of delivering about 14,000 babies in my career. It's because we are the ones who always have to do with crisis. It's always about the patient screaming, the husband fainting, a baby to deliver, and we are the ones who say push, push, push the best. So, uh, you know, I've switched gears, obviously, to becoming, I guess, uh, a part of the humanitarian sector. And right now I head something called the World Humanitarian Summit Secretariat, which is at the United Nations in New York. So if you allow me, I would like to share a little bit of what I do because it really is um, really quite relevant to what you do. Uh, and um, I guess it's also going to be a call for help to all of you. So as the Christmas uh, decorations go up each year, it's a painful time for me because on the 26th December of 2003, we had the BAM earthquake in Iran. On the 26th of December 2004, we had the tsunami in Aceh. And I come from Malaysia, so it's very close to my heart because we did lose uh, people in the north of Malaysia from the tsunami. And this year is an important year because it's the 10th anniversary. And already now I've been receiving emails and invitations to come back to Aceh to be with the people to reflect on the last 10 years. I'm a member of the United Nations Disaster Assessment Coordination Team and I get a ping on my phone every time there's an earthquake. And this time it was an orange-red alert. And it was off the coast of Aceh, which is very close to where I live. And I was running a humanitarian organization called Mercy Malaysia at the time. And yet, when I turned on the television, there was absolutely nothing on Aceh. It was all about Phuket. It was Sri Lanka. There's nothing much about Aceh. At the time, I sat down with my team and I said, something's not right. There is nothing coming up from there, which means all the communications are down. Many, of peop many people don't realize that Aceh was actually a conflict area. It was actually close to people coming in and out of the province. It had a lot of problems with the central government of Indonesia. And what we did then was really pack our bags and find our way to Aceh. And of course, you know, the devastation is, is just horrible. At that time, too, there was no such thing as Twitter. And, you know, social media was not really what it was, what it is now. So people were then unable to communicate, not just because there was no social media, but also the phone lines were down. There was no way we could get information in or out for some time. And I think that was really the turning point you know, for me to look at how information becomes so important and how assistance comes so late when you're unable to communicate. And it was a really turning point in the history of Indonesia because there was more military presence than any known world war or war in the past. There's just so much military presence that really, a lot of these photographs are actually from the United States uh, Navy and, and so forth. So it, it's, it's a very historic moment to really think about how the world has changed in the humanitarian sector for the last 10 years. Next, please. Um, so, so much has changed. Uh, as you can tell, I'm not really a geek. I still have these. But uh, there's a reason why I hold these, because there's a story to it. Um, you know, now, if you go out into any crisis situation, you get people with handheld PDAs, you know, mobile phones, and so forth. All assessments are now done through iPads, and so on and so forth. But I still remember going to meet people affected by crisis, particularly in Indonesia and the tsunami again, if I can use that as a reference point. You know, they used to tell me that people would just come and ask for information. So they said, we have death by tsunami, and then we nearly die because we keep having to answer everyone. 
when they ask us for assessments, and yet we don't get anything. We just have to give information, we give information, we give information, we get nothing. They don't even get information, and they don't get any aid, just a lot of questions. So I think, but now, the beauty is now with technology and with you know, mobile technology particularly, even in places uh, as remote as in some parts of Africa, and I think this is in Mali, where you can even register births uh, through SMS, which is really wonderful uh, because it allows people to have an identity. So if I look back at, again, what happened then when there was no technology, I'll tell you a story of how someone then decided, it was actually the Irish Red Cross and a couple of people who wanted to set up a um, psychosocial service for women and, and people affected by the tsunami, the victims. And nobody would come to the clinics or the, or the, the tents that were having this service because they didn't realize that there was a social stigma to actually saying that you had a psychological problem. But what they did then was they actually said, oh, well, let's use radio. And by that time, the mobile network was up. And uh, people could talk about, you know, the two psychologists would sit there and talk about psychosocial problems following trauma and so on and so forth. And people could actually SMS questions. It became such a huge hit that you got more psychosocial uh, support through a radio station and the use of SMS. And I think that really was a very important a turning point as well for health providers in looking at how do you then use simple tools like radio, community radios, and SMS platforms to actually provide information and also get information. So just some, some stories about how um, that has happened. Now we know that we can easily go into getting Google Maps. Uh, we can get you know the era of big data now, and we have a lot of advances uh, made in the humanitarian sectors in so many ways. So many of these advancements are putting people in direct contact with other people thousands of miles away. A former speaker mentioned about Haiti and how the crisis mappers, the open street, oh, the whole, you know, this whole crisis mappers group really evolved and grew from strength to strength from the Haiti crisis many miles away, they were, they were provide, providing mapping and, and so on and so forth. And I think many people don't realize it was after the Haiti uh, crisis, the Haiti earthquake, the Japan earthquake, that many crisis mappers actually were the same people who were involved in the Haiti who actually went out to help uh, map some of the areas in Japan. So having all that, you know, has it really helped us as a humanitarian sector? Not really because the humanitarian number of hum people who need humanitarian assistance and protection has really doubled in the last decade. In the first half of this year, more than 100 million people are in urgent need of humanitarian assistance, and this is before Ebola. And that is also before the escalation of conflict uh, in Iraq and South Sudan. Some of this is due to the increasing frequency and severity of climate change effects, like natural disasters, and the overlapping consequences of global trends, particularly on climate and also very rapid urbanization, which really is the potential for a huge crisis of the next, next generation. But it is really conflicts that take the main humanitarian caseload. 80% of what we do in the humanitarian sector is really conflict-related. Yet we don't see so much of the crisis mapping, we don't see so much of the technology being employed in conflict settings. And without trying to undermine all the wonderful efforts of people in technology who are helping in humanitarian crisis, yes, it's very, if I may use the word sexy, to be seen in Haiti and you know earthquakes and to be involved in the Ebola crisis, they need the help. But just as many people have died in the Central African Republic as Ebola, and we don't hear anything about what's going on there, there's a real imbalance as well in where the needs are and where we actually act. So this is something that we really need to think about it. And the number of people who are affected by conflicts around the world right now and displaced 
is the highest since the end of World War II. And what's more worrying is 10 million women, men, boys and girls are actually stateless. And this has become the new campaign for the UNHCR to look at statelessness, which is a real issue. Millions of people live in limbo in refugee camps or IDP camps, internally displaced people's camps, some for more than a decade. There's a need for durable solutions, and I'm sure that there is some way we can come together, as um, the previous speaker mentioned, about how we, as a technology and humanitarian, and need to come together and find some of these durable solutions. So let me talk a little bit about why we have the World Humanitarian Summit. The World Humanitarian Summit was, is, has been called for by the Secretary General of the United Nations as an initiative that will be held in May 2016 in Istanbul because we need to find a new way of doing things. Humanitarian needs have changed and humanitarian action must change along with it. But what we've identified is that we will do this as a non-intergovernmental process which means you and me, everyone in this room, affected people, NGOs, the UN, governments, private sector, diaspora, all have a say in what we're going to do at the World Humanitarian Summit. So to do this, what we're doing is running eight regional consultations. We go from region to region to region, and we talk to all the different groups of people I've mentioned, and we try to listen to them and try to get new ways and try to figure out how can we design, design a system that will be fit for future? This is why I need to talk to you, Nedan. So what we have done is we've been able to identify six core challenges. And they're all interconnected. The first is, of course, the finance gap. Needs are increasing that way. The money that's available is like that. How are we going to deal with the crises that are increasing? We can't keep just putting money in. What we need to do is find new ways where humanitarian and development actors play their roles better and to have some discipline on where we are crisis critical, uh, to be there or mission critical, and, and to find are there new ways that we can deliver assistance? Where's the role of the private sector? What is the role of strengthening local authorities and really getting governments to be more responsible and so on and so forth? So we're looking at these areas. We're also looking at the increasing flagrant disrespect for international humanitarian law. You and I know that a lot of humanitarian workers are being killed, and this is again a violation of international humanitarian law. The whole basis of our humanitarian principles are being violated day by day. What are we going to do about this? We can't keep going to the Security Council and saying, this is violating of violation of humanitarian law, this is a violation of humanitarian principles, and yet nothing is done. Is there a new way of us uh, looking at these issues of uh, conflict and, 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 and laws. Thirdly, there's a lack of cohesion between humanitarian and development actors. I know that not all of you understand maybe fully the humanitarian development divide, but the development actors really are the longer term actors who, who stay in countries to help them achieve develop, development goals. And I think there's a, always a, a real discord between you know, a, real, a real gap between both what the humanitarian and development actors do. And we need to close this. And we, we can use technology as one way that we can monitor and map and how we can close that gap. And then fourthly, we have increased fragmentation of approaches to humanitarianism, which is really usually underpinned by a lack of understanding of humanitarian principles. On the fifth area, we hear very loud and clear from affected people, from governments, that we want things to be localized. We want now to be in charge of our own response, particularly on natural disasters. You hear from the Philippine government, oh my goodness, the first disaster was the Typhoon Haiyan, and then it was all these people coming in and sort of you know, disrupting some of the mechanisms that we already have in place at local level. So there's a strong call for national and local ownership. And for the importance of recognizing the local actors are there first. They understand context. They understand the culture and their best place to be the persons who deliver assistance. And finally, how do we deal with these challenges against the backdrop of an overwhelming need that is stretching the system to its limits? 
So one way we have to look at it is that, you know, the future is really now. This, the World Winter and Summit is this once-in-a-lifetime opportunity. This is the first time we're bringing together all these different actors to re-examine the rules of humanitarianism, to be bold, to try and put forward, forward new ideas and maybe new ways that we work with all the different actors that I've mentioned before and to keep humanitarian action that's fit for future. There are four core themes of the World Humanitarian Summit one of which is transformation through innovation. And it's really very, I'm so delighted that, you know, our, our ASG has mentioned how important innovation is, because it, it is. Innovation is required in, you know, almost everything that we do now in the humanitarian sector. And we are looking at it through the four thematic areas that we are focusing on in the summit. Firstly, on effectiveness. How do we become more effective in our action? How do we reduce vulnerability? How do we manage risks better? How do we just transform through innovative ideas and processes? And how do we leverage on technology? And finally, how do we bring innovation into serving the needs of people in conflict? I've thrown a challenge to you that 80% of our humanitarian needs are in conflict. And therefore, we need to really try to step up. If we are going to be good crisis mappers, we've got to look into this area as well and not be afraid to try and figure out how do you leverage the technology and, 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 and um, that will, can help us look at serving the needs of people in conflict. When we talk about reducing risks and vulnerability, the overwhelming demand that we are hearing from people affected by crises is that innovation should not be short term and it should be durable. We want to find solutions, they said, that will help communities become stronger, more resilient. They want solutions that will help to prevent, prepare, manage, and mitigate crises themselves. It's about, it's telling us that when, peop, when we ask people in different regions that we've talked to, to submit to us their innovative ideas, we don't get sort of innovative, zany ideas on what we do in response. What we do get is, for example, SMS e-based systems, health systems that was developed by a doctor in Chad to monitor disease and prevent the risk of some, some diseases such as Bahasia. We get an early warning app developed by World Vision in Southern Africa that helps local communities and organizations create um, their own indicators for early warning, uh, early warning systems that help them manage their own risks. So it's really very much a push towards preparedness and prevention and mitigation. So I think that's a very welcoming sign because while on the one side, the crisis mappers, the technology people, are all driven by response, and you ask the affected people, they really want you to focus on managing risk, preparedness, and mitigation. So how has that happened? Is it because we haven't really listened to people and we make assumptions on what needs are based on our own areas of strengths and understanding? That's a question probably we need to ask ourselves. Yet there are still huge gaps uh, in, uh, that are still present. Advances in sensor technology have helped us to better predict drought in regions such as the Sahel. But we need new ways of working so that we can ensure that the early warning leads to proactive response before a food crisis happens. So it's very much in line with the kissing bug. You know, we know what might be able to be done. We have, we have, we can monitor rainfall patterns uh, that might lead to a crisis in future. We can do all that. We can get the data for that. What we now need to do is translate that into action that actually prevents crisis happening. In serving the needs of people in conflict, we are quick to rally around natural disasters, as I mentioned before, and yet we're very slow on, on the conflict side. But the challenge is that humanitarians face increasing risks and also denial of access to people who are affected by conflict. But we need to now turn to maybe technology for some innovative ways. And how can we get information to these people? And how can we get information? How can we help them when you don't have direct access? 
Many of you are probably um, familiar with uh, some of the work done by a group of people who were trying to help document the atrocities in Darfur. Um, we go back to the previous slide, Sebastian, you will see that uh, this was, I happened to be in Harvard at the time, and the headlines in the Boston Globe was inside George Clooney's Harvard spy lab. Some of you may know about this, um, but basically it was um, Harvard uh, was able to track through satellite imagery the movements of, of people, and they actually saw that there were troops coming into harm uh, some populations, and they provided warnings, and of course they were called George Clooney's spy lab. Why did it need to have George Clooney to bring attention to Darfur? I mean, it's great that he did it, but it tells you how the world is, is it's quite bizarre, that you really need celebrities and, and people to shout out that these people are dying and being killed or whatever, before we really have action taken. And again, I go back to the Central African Republic uh, example that the same number of people are dying as Ebola as to Central African Republic. We hear nothing about them. So, but awareness alone is not enough. Uh, how can we innovate to meet the needs of people who are displaced? Uh, we are now increasingly exploring the use of uh, UAVs, drones, to uh, access the extent of need in remote areas. But drones can tell you what's happening. Potentially, they can send you some assistance, but they cannot deliver on protection. And, and that's a critical part of what humanitarians must do. The protection must be really the core of our humanitarian imperative. So to make full use of the potential of technology in emergencies, we just need to find better ways of working together and working with a new range of act actors like you and especially the private sector. How can we better leverage these partnerships? For example, putting in place advanced agreements to ensure that telecommunication needs and infrastructure is established quickly after a disaster. How do, we enable, how do we quickly receive data that we need and send vital information and even mobile money to people who are in need? And I think right now in crisis situations, one of the things we realize that's really working well, one of the best innovations is mobile money. But another very good way that we might have to think about how we get feedback from people is to set up SMS platforms for establishing feedback mechanisms from people affected by crisis. Are we actually giving them the assistance they need? Are they happy with us? One of my big dreams is you know, if someone can set up a Yelp for humanitarian assistance where people can go in and say, no, this is a two-star uh, service that I got from Organization X. Uh, you know. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, but you know what? It, 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 you have to close that feedback loop. You have to get people who are providing service to be able to tell. One of you, please take it up. Uh, I know, please help me. Let's develop a Yelp for, for humanitarian assistance, yeah? And, and uh, therefore, not only, you know, Yelp has been interesting because it has also been used now by the health departments uh, to actually track uh, water, waterborne diseases. I mean, if people start complaining that they get diarrhea after a restaurant, uh, eating in a restaurant, then they kind of know where, you know, there might be water issues and so on and so forth. So why can't we use things like this, right? And, and, but innovation is not just about technology. And, and, and uh, in many places, radio is still the preferred uh, channel of communication. I mentioned about Aceh, they're still using it in many places. Internews is really doing such wonderful work all over the world. In South Sudan, uh, they use this uh, Boda Boda Tok Tok, um, which has really a very innovative mobile radio program uh, and broadcasts important information that allows IDPs to share their concerns and their views. And SMS is still the preferred uh, mode and most accessible means of collecting data and disseminating information. And I think the most current use right now is really in Liberia and Sierra Leone with the Ebola uh, response um, ongoing. The accuracy of epidemiological data is so important in managing a health crisis. And, uh, but that's compounded by information gaps and also as a result of lack of infrastructure for support or communications. As I walked in, I was trying to get a Wi-Fi and I realized it was really difficult. Number one, you have to put in so many passwords and codes, but the other thing is because so many people are using the Wi-Fi, it's actually very difficult for us to use the, the, 
the remote for the slides, you know, because there's so many people using Wi-Fi. So you can imagine now, if it's in Liberia, one of the biggest problems now is because there's an overload of people actually using the SMS as well, that services are down, and sometimes SMS arrive two days after. And what happened is that only seven out of 16 counties in Sierra Leone, I beg your pardon, in Liberia, were actually reporting Ebola deaths. So although you see a decline in death, you might think, oh yeah, we're getting a hang of this and we're getting control of Ebola, but actually the, what's really worrying is only seven out of 16 are actually reporting it. And similarly in Sierra Leone, you see a rise in the numbers that are being reported, mainly because the mobile platforms are up and people can actually communicate. So data becomes so important. So I think that the Ebola response has shown us how debilitating it can be when there is no coverage. The response to Ebola by companies, including Google and Facebook uh, now, uh, to improve data collection and also to help uh, humanitarian workers do their work by providing satellite internet connection and so forth, is a good example how powerful the private sector you know, is in providing a real support role to humanitarian action. And how do we harness that in a much more systematic way, not just in emergency? How do we bring that into also building resilience and prevention and warning and so on and so forth? So true innovation, if you ask me, is about meeting people's needs and meeting them in the way that is most appropriate to them and according to their own local context, their own local culture, and this is one of the ways that we are hoping in our summit to engage with people, affected people, to bring that to the forefront that it no longer is a one-size-fits-all. It really must be a menu of options and how we actually meet the needs of people. I think that we are living on the edge of big data, um, and I think we need to be able to harness that a little bit better. There are many questions in my mind about big data that, yes, we mine big data and we mine it and we use it using our assumptions. Maybe we need to start looking at other ways we use this data. Are we effective as humanitarian actors? How does the UN, how does the NGO work in terms of its cost effectiveness? Can we use big data to figure this out? Can we figure out really what is what is the next generation of humanitarian action going to look like? I'm putting this challenge out there, hoping some of you will come on board and help me. And we're really struggling uh, to find better ways to systematically use information in emergencies. We hear the good success stories, but we also hear the horror stories when too much information is just as bad as too little information. And I think that you know we need to triangulate how do we know information is accurate. Sometimes it can be very damaging and very harmful when we actually get wrong information. I remember when in Thailand, when they had the floods, they actually had to come up with a really nice little commercial and television so that people wouldn't panic because there's so much on social media about the floods that people started panicking and they had to say, you know, how do you take information? How do you use this information and what might you use? And I think this is where our collaboration with digital volunteers has been really helpful to really help us map things out. And I think that also, if you look at Typhoon Haiyan, you know, when it hit the Philippines almost also exactly a year ago, some areas were so cut off with no connectivity for weeks. The other thing is, you know, as human beings, and you're exposed to all this social media, every tweet that you get that someone doesn't have access to water or food, you know, you can't go on to respond to every tweet. But I think with, with digital volunteerism and mapping and really good analysis, we know that if there's an influx of tweets for one area, then we know water and food are required there. How do we now find this, this, this collaborative way to, to, to marry that data collection with analysis with appropriate action for the people who are affected? I think there's still a lot of need for boots on the ground I think information and technology is only as good as the people who can also go out there to deliver the assistance or better still for people there to find assistance in their own way. And I think I, went, I talked about cash uh, 
mobile cash and so forth. I think that's one of the new ways that we can really leverage on. I think that the increasing availability of data and emergency also poses some ethical challenges, especially on data privacy and protection. We're now beginning to see new challenges such as cyber attacks by groups like the Syrian Electronic Army. Deliberately targeting humanitarian organizations' information systems to steal data for their own purposes, sometimes resulting in the disappearance or torture of people assisting humanitarian organizations on the ground. So these are real challenges that you know, we need to start thinking about the ethics and the protection of, of data and privacy and humanitarian workers as well. I think the digital community has really contributed greatly to the humanitarian data gathering, analysis, and mapping. Um, and I think we need to keep doing this so that we can make better decisions in emergencies. I mentioned about Haiti, and I think that's been an unprecedented uh, start to how the crisis mappers really map the whole country. And I think that you know, you've done a really a great job uh, also with the Ebola crisis. At OCHA, uh, the parent organization where I come from, the Office for Coordination of Humanitarian Affairs, we're trying to make better use of huge amounts of data now through initiatives like the Humanitarian Data Exchange. And watch out for that, it's really quite interesting, where volunteers can download data sets and help us to create cutting edge visualizations and customizable reports. But we can do better. We have hundreds of maps created but how do we communicate those maps or the, that information better to people? And therefore, it gives, brings me the story to these index cards. Uh, in 2005, I was on the mountainside in, the, in Pakistan, leading an UNDAC team, and uh, we were very closely on the border of Pakistan and India. There were three of us uh, sent up to set up a humanitarian hub where 85% of the whole city was damaged and a lot of people were killed. Phone, the phones were working on and off. Um, it was, no one wanted to come there because it was really out in the boondocks and we needed information and we needed to coordinate. Uh, there was no choice except to use uh, big pieces of white flip chart paper, little flat index cards like this. Uh, and I had to use my very little limited art talent to draw a map of the district by hand and then got people to come around with little red pins and stick them on, the, on this map to say where are they doing work. And it was very easy to then see without, you know, that was a primitive map, but you can then actually take photographs of that and send it to Islamabad and say, guys, you need to come here because this is really not sustainable and it's gonna make us look really bad if we're gonna send maps with pins and my very bad art uh, you know, out all over the world. But it, it was really a way that we had to when you're desperate and you don't have the technology, I mean, you have to go back to pen and paper sometimes. And it comes also to you know, my big fear that we are so dependent on technology. What happens if we have cybernetic failure? What will happen to us when we become so dependent on, on you know, cyber satellite, satellite technology? And, you know, and, the, and the reality is it might happen. There's a lot of people who are looking to future analytics, and this is one area they're very worried about. But the, the funniest part of that story was that it was really hard to get people to come and, and put a pin on that piece of paper and the map, but I had the only toilet key. Um, <laughs> I made friends with some of the villagers, and uh, there was one house that had a wonderful toilet and, and running water. So the, the people kind of trusted me and gave me the key, and I kind of said, oh, well, this is the key to coordination. Uh, you know, so if people wanted to use the toilets, then they would have to come and give me information, and then I would lend them the key. So sometimes, you know, a little bit of arm twisting and common sense uh, really helps. So um, I think the discourse around innovation, technology, information often becomes centered around the needs of governments, UN agencies, international humanitarian organizations. I want us to refocus the conversations. I want us to look at what tools we need in order to make data more accessible to people affected by crisis and conflict. And how can we make sure the information meets their needs, helps them make better decisions, 
I'm sure you have examples. I would like to hear them uh, and maybe we can share with each other. And how can we then use these information tools and technology to empower people, to give them more control, to give them more agency in making decisions about how their needs are met uh, and when and in what way? So this is what I'm asking you today. I'm asking you to help us solve these challenges, help us to agree on principles and standards and ethics that can guide us as we meet these challenges. Help us to give power back to the people. Create tools that are adapted to their needs. Create tools that put them in the driver's seat of humanitarian response. Focus on preparedness. OpenStreetMaps has done tremendous work mapping cities like Yogyakarta, where tsunami evacuations uh, are now being designed on your open street maps, and I think we need to do many, many more of these things. We need a platform to bring the crisis mappers and humanitarian and development actors together. How do we create that platform? And I'm looking at Nigel that, you know, maybe we, this is the beginning of something, that we need to create this platform, and therefore we can have meaningful discussions on how we can get the best of both worlds. So over the next year and a half, uh, we will be consulting people from everywhere. We will be looking for new partnerships and seeking to launch bold transformative initiatives. We want to look for solutions that will help us address some of our pressing challenges. Uh, we want to really, together, hopefully look for hope and dignity for millions of people. And we must find better ways to meet humanitarian needs, not just for this generation, but also the next. Young people have come up to us in the regional consultations to say, use us. We can be the people who will stop conflict because we can influence our young people on the, risk, on the risky behavior. I think we need to engage them. They're the ones who are using your techn the technology we have. UNICEF is using the U, um, I can't remember what it's called now, but for Ebola. But I think uh, we have to look at you people, the younger ones, and the younger generation for this. So with that, I recognize that David Miliband has just walked in. And um, so thank you very much, everyone.